Okay, sorry about the delay. Uh, <clears throat> we will start again. I think just the first slide is just why our state-owned enterprise is important to, to look at it when you are in the public sector, and I think your presentation showed it very clearly. Uh, very often, state-owned enterprises make up a large part of the economy, and therefore, of course, running them efficiently is important because that way around, you can, uh, if you get your state-owned enterprise to be more efficient, you can release resources for other part of the economy, either labor or capital. Uh, secondly, state-owned enterprises are present in, uh, in, in network industries where they provide very important inputs for other sectors and other private sectors. So if you manage to get your state-owned enterprises more efficient, uh, that would provide better and cheaper services for private sector and therefore also be able to support uh, productivity gains in the private sector. And then the third effect is that it's often a sizable assets for governments and of course if you have an asset you would like it to give it a return and for a government of course state-owned enterprises ought to give a return which you can then use to support uh, your uh, public budget and uh, whatever you want to use your money for. Uh, I will skip the last bit. Uh, that said, I should say I come from a country where state-owned enterprises actually doesn't uh, have a very large role compared to other countries. Uh, and that's also why I decided to call this uh, in a Nordic perspective uh, and not just a Danish perspective because that would seem a bit sad. Uh, as you can see in the table uh, uh, to the left, uh, you can see in Denmark we have presently ownership shares in 28 uh, enterprises, uh, which 12 are wholly owned by, by the Danish state. Uh, and sort of a rough estimation says that its value of, of those uh, holdings are around 3% of GDP, so it's, it's quite tiny. Uh, but looking to my uh, uh, Nordic colleagues in Finland, Norway, and Sweden, you can see they have uh, far more uh, state-owned enterprises and their value are sort of uh, six times, eight times bigger than the one we have in Denmark. Uh, so when we meet in the group of uh, colleagues uh, from the Nordic countries, I'm always a little brother and uh, I'm happy to be allowed to actually participate in their meetings because I think it's too little to, to be bothered about. Uh, <clears throat> just looking at it in the Nordic countries, we have stayed on enterprises in the same sectors as you'll see elsewhere. It's infrastructure, other network work industries, airlines, different kinds of transportation, uh, particularly in Norway, Sweden, and Finland, they also have state-owned enterprises in, in natural resource uh, sectors, uh, financial sectors, and then all countries have a number of special purpose vehicles, which, by which I mean companies that have been established to do special things for, for the government sector, and it's not really up for privatization. So just one example is we have a company in Denmark that built big bridges over uh, our different waters, and it is never meant to be uh, uh, privatized, but it's just a way of organizing things. Um, so that was sort of a very brief introduction to, to the state-owned sectors in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, then let me turn a little bit to the reform process. Uh, uh, and I think the driving factors for the reform process we have been through in the Nordic countries, which are run more or less in parallel, started actually back in the 1980s, where for several reasons, uh, people start to open market for competition. In the EU, it was the in decision on the internal market in 86. And of course, a lot of the then state-owned enterprises then had to face competition uh, and had to work in, 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 in real markets. And of course, that kind of uh, provoked a lot of thoughts of then, are we, how are we actually going to deal with state-owned enterprises when we have open markets? Uh, so I think that has been one driving factor, and the other one was in the late uh, 2000s that uh, uh, came an increased focus globally on, on corporate governance of uh, uh, private listed companies uh, in terms of transparency, what are they going to say, shareholders' uh, role in, in, in running listed companies. And I think those two trends merged, and uh, in all four of the Nordic countries, uh, uh, new ownership policies were uh, defined in the uh, late 2000s uh, and it was then followed by OECD guidelines on corporate governance which was first published in 2005 
And I should say, I think more or less through the whole, there is a working group in the OECD uh, that did these guidelines. And I think uh, for most of the time of that working group, it has been in a person from the Nordic countries that have been chairman. So, so there's a lot of similarities in, in the OECD guidelines and, and the way we, we go about it in, in the Nordic countries. So, so it's about 10 years ago that uh, policies were reformulated and, and I can see looking to my Nordic colleagues they have or are just about to redefine or, 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 or make their guidelines, uh, update their guidelines and the same is true for the OECD guidelines where a public consultation is actually undergoing uh, right now. Uh, I don't expect that any of these will lead to big revolutions in, in the way we go about things, so it's more a matter of refining things and uh, of course we have learned something over the past 10 years which we now have to try to implement in, in our guidelines. I think the starting point which become clearer and clearer and I think John's presentation supported is that uh, although we kind of fell in love with the, uh, fall in love with the communities we work with. We also recognize that the state is a weak owner uh, uh, for many reasons. Uh, some, including some of the newspapers, claim that it's because the civil servants are not good at their jobs. Uh, so that's the main thing. So you should just hire better bureaucrats and uh, then the state-owned enterprises would be very efficient and very well run. There might be something to that story, but I also believe that there are some more institutionally based reason why it's very hard for you know, governments to run companies in an efficient manner. I've just <coughs> taken some of the reasons uh, in here and I think the first reason is that ownership of commercial enterprises will never be the core of, of a government, uh, I think at least in the Nordic. Uh, a government is neither elected nor not re-elected uh, because of what is happening in the state-owned enterprises. The, there are so many other agendas. So. So uh, the state-owned enterprises never get the political focus and sort of the advantages you have if, if you have an owner which is, is very strongly focused on trying to run the business and, and getting uh, things right. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason is that even though you can try to do a lot to try and say that state-owned enterprises is separate from, from government, there will always be a tendency that uh, political pressures will arise and it can either be governments that try to take the phone and, 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 and call the companies to, to do something uh, which is not commercially sound because there might be a short-sighted political gain. But it can also be the other way around and that is that some of the state-owned enterprises are so big that they can actually influence uh, uh, policy is not for the greater good but to uh, further their own agenda and I think that is a very uh, unfortunate mixture uh, where things get uh, muddy, muddy and, and, and you never get to the right solutions. Uh, so I think that's uh, one reason why I think states will never become uh, very good owners of, of commercial enterprises. Uh, uh, and as I said, the consequences of that is that uh, we frequently see, or my experience is that our enterprises often get their own agenda that they follow. So they, they know they have an owner, but it's uh, very unclear what the owner wants. And therefore, the company, the management, can tend to follow their own agenda. And uh, it can be that they want uh, growth rather than efficiency. I think that's what we typically see. that. They think it's fun to go out investing and uh, the shareholder never expect a return, so who cares? So I might as well go out and take some chances. Uh, and then that often leads to an effect where the risk return profile of the company get wrong, that they take on too big risk uh, without having considered sort of the, the downside of that. Uh, I think if I should just a single anecdote is that, that I went many years ago to a meeting with a CEO of one of our state owned enterprises and uh, we said to him, uh, we would like to have some dividend from your company. You're earning all this money, so why can't we get something in dividend? And his response was that if it should be in that way, then he'll make sure we'll never get a dividend because he could just make the uh, profit go away. So, so that was his, that if he couldn't keep the money to make new investments, then, then uh, oh, my, uh, it was again. Good, so uh, that was just uh, why the state is a weak owner and of course uh, from that it leads to the first question uh, which I'll go into is uh, sort of the optimal scope 
uh, of state-owned enterprises. And it follows if the state is weak, then of course we ought to privatize and get rid of uh, as many state-owned uh, companies as we, uh, we, as, as we can. Uh, or put it otherwise, that if the state is to own uh, enterprises, there should be very strong reasons for that, and that should go beyond sort of the pure commercial reasons. It's just not just a matter that the state can get a return. Uh, because if that was the objective of the state, we could invest in all kinds of other companies. So we could invest in U.S. companies or in purely private companies. We don't have to be a majority owner. So there must be strong reasons uh, why the state should own things. I've just listed a few uh, examples of uh, that kind of rationale for state ownership. Uh, I think natural resources uh, might be a very good reason for state ownership, in particular if you find it difficult to make a uh, sort of appropriate tax system where you can get the res resource rent uh, uh, tax by, by government, then that might be a reason why you would like to have a state ownership instead. Uh, then there are the classic natural monopolies of infrastructure. Again, if you don't feel comfortable, you can get a regulatory framework to avoid monopoly profits and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, state ownership might be a a substitute for that, and uh, I think in particular in some of the Nordic countries, uh, more geopolitical reasons play in that one of the big fears in Europe these days is that uh, the Russian Gazprom comes and takes over our entire energy infrastructure, so there are some concerns about that. Uh, uh, then I'll skip the third and just go to, to the fourth one, which I know is it's a matter where our Norwegian and Finnish colleagues are very concerned. And that if, if they're privatized and it's all in the open foreign uh, hands, uh, then they might lose some headquarter uh, functions, well-paid job, uh, and stuff like that. So they try to, to, to keep some stakes in, in their listed companies. Uh, I think uh, normally in, 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 in uh, the Scandinavian countries, you'll need 10% of, uh, uh, of a company, then you can uh, 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 avoid that it's delisted and being taken over. So they want to keep the companies as independent entities. Uh, so I think that's the first lesson uh, from what I would say is that the state is a weak owner, therefore you should only keep state or enterprises if there are very good reasons uh, uh, for having that. And that will, of course, as I showed on the previous page, uh, mean that the state would actually own a number of companies that all uh, uh, points in time, at least as far as I can see, in the Nordic countries, and uh, then a lot of work has gone in the recent years tried to find the optimal or the best possible governance model where we can have, given that, that we will have state-owned enterprises. Uh, and I think the best, it's not a perfect model, uh, I can assure you, but uh, I still think it's uh, sort of the best model for governing state-owned enterprises running a, uh, along the dots I put in here. Uh, the first is that the state and enterprise should be run at arm's length, so, so it be a clear division where the state is acting as a normal shareholder. Uh, it's not necessarily clear what a normal shareholder is, but in, in our line of thinking in Denmark, it's kind of a big institutional investor uh, having a significant position in a listed company. So uh, that's how we perceive ourselves, uh, because we don't want to get too close to the company, but we don't want to be too far away. So. So I think we have defined ourselves as sort of a pension fund or something like that, having a 10, 20% stake in, in a company, and that's the way we should act as a shareholder. Uh, and then at the other end of the arm, we will have the company that should then be giving a lot of freedom to run the company in terms of making all operational decisions, investment decisions, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, and it also means in Denmark that in the Nordic countries, that uh, the board of directors are primarily uh, filled with people who are not uh, employed in the civil service, so it's ex people that are external to, to the government. So we try to create this uh, arms links. Uh, however, as an owner, we cannot just sit back. Uh, I think the state audit criticized me last year for having slept for three years, uh, but I got my pay in, in a report. Uh, I think it was a bit unfair, but. Uh, as course, uh, we, we need as shareholders, of course, to be actually following our state-owned enterprises. And I think one thing we are struggling with in all of the free Nordic countries uh, these days is to how can we better to define targets, uh, the scope uh, for the board of directors and, and the companies. Uh, and I think we all, all of the Nordic countries work sort of with a three-dimensional uh, way of setting <coughs> targets. Uh, 
One thing is that it's very important that the state uh, uh, become aware why are we owning this company. Is it just something we have for historical reasons or what is the purpose, what is it that we would like to achieve or think the company should uh, achieve? Uh, that, you know, that, of course, leads into to the second uh, objective, which is, uh, I think, as an owner, we have a responsibility to discuss with the board of directors what should be the, uh, the strategic direction of the company. What should they be allowed? Should they be allowed to go abroad and invest, which a lot of them would like to do, uh, at least in Denmark? Uh, that's sort of the CEO's dream is to make investments in other countries. But why should, on the other hand, why should taxpayers be exposed to risk uh, running businesses on purely commercial terms in, in other countries. Uh, and then, <coughs> then there's a third level of target setting and which we're also working on is try to make some specific targets for each uh, company. But again, at a pretty overall level uh, where it's easy, easy to observe whether the goals are achieved or not uh, based on accounts. So it's things like return on capital, uh, some efficiency, uh, targets, uh, capital structure, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think I already taken the third, so let me go to the fourth. And then I think the fourth important thing, uh, which I think we have fairly progressed in the Nordic countries, is that it's very important that there are transparent financial relationship between the state and the SOEs. Uh, I think that's the way to run things uh, for several reasons. It's good for the state and for, for the Ministry of Finance that we can always see whatever obligations we might have through our state on enterprises uh, through either explicit or implicit guarantees, uh, that kind of uh, things. Uh, 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 and it's also, of course, important if you have markets which are open to competition, where we have this whole discussion of creating a level playing field, and the playing field is not uh, level if state-owned companies have an implicit or explicit state guarantee that would give them advantages and, and uh, these things. So, uh, so I think these are sort of, in very broad terms, sort of the overall government's model that, that we work with in for the past 10, 20 years in, in the Nordic countries and we'll go on working with, but we'll hopefully be able to refine it and be better to, to, to do our jobs. So thank you very much.